Uh, glad that you could make it this morning, and we're going to uh, just, I guess, get started right away. Ten rule. I want to preface this first. Ten rules. You notice it doesn't say the ten rules. It's just ten of the rules for modern beekeeping, because I'm sure that there's more. All beekeeping is local, and things that are going to affect me here in Ohio may not have as much effect of you if you're in Florida or California or Australia. So keep that in mind as we go through this. I've tried to be general enough to encompass everybody, but at the same time, um, I know that there's uh, other things going on in the beekeeping world. But these are, that I've found, 10 rules uh, that work well for modern beekeeping and if you follow them you're gonna if you are aware of them let me put it that way if you're aware of them you're going to uh, be able to uh, notice and take care of and help with and do a lot of the things that are gonna make your bees thrive not just survive so let's get started and of course the center of the universe is a good queen and without a good queen, everything else you do is just not going not gonna to pay off. So starting rule number one, have good queens. And by good queens, what I'm talking about is a queen. You see there it says raised in luxury. And what I mean by that is, is a queen that comes from a producer that is really taking care of business. That, that queen grew up in a, in a colony that is uncontaminated with, with uh, uh, residue in the wax that has, that has way more nurse bees than, than you sh she could possibly need so that she's fed everything that she needs as often as she needs and, and that, that um, uh, everything that could go right goes right in that with that queen when she's being raised in that colony uh, and that's you know that makes perfect sense but unfortunately too often it, it, it doesn't happen uh, we get queens that are average uh, didn't have enough food uh, maybe had some chemicals in the colony queens that are raised in colonies that have uh, contaminated wax in them from pesticides beekeeper applied pesticides especially uh, don't come out as good as those that are raised in an environment without or certainly with far less. So raised in luxury, extremely mated. The, the, the contemporary um, uh, thought is that queens are, are mating with upwards to 20 drones in, in their uh, mating, on their mating flights. And, and I'd like to see 40. I think uh, I don't know if, if a queen could mate with 40, but but the the more queens, uh, the more drones that a queen is able to couple with, the greater the diversity in the colony that she's going to produce, and the better that colony is going to do. Just it's just it's just mathematics. So uh, when a queen is being uh, putting in a put in a mating nuke, I want to know that she's there's so many drones out there that she all she has to do is wink and and there are 40 drones waiting to waiting to uh, get in line so extremely well mated um, you know the you you well know that a uh, queen that isn't mated isn't going to last they run out of she runs out of sperm or and and then she gets replaced and you're the one who suffers that so extremely mated 20 30 drones as many as you can get out of there healthy beyond belief that goes. That too goes without saying, and it's sort of like the first one, raised in luxury. But once I get a queen out of the colony that's been that she's been raised in, and you're putting her in a mating nuke, or she, or, or uh, you're banking her, I want that colony to be almost sterile in terms of of uh, anything. While she's being held, and while things are getting, um, uh, you're, you're, she's getting ready to come to your colony. So healthy beyond belief, and an egg-laying machine, absolutely an egg-laying machine. Uh, how do you how do you know how many eggs your queen's laying? And and that's a question you kind of look and you say, yeah, there's frames of brood and and uh, there's open brood and there's lots of sealed brood, but how do you know how well, well? That's what you need to figure out, and that's that's one of the indicators that you can measure and you can control. So when you want to know how many eggs per day your queen is laying, what do the books say? Twelve hundred, two thousand, something like that. She should be laying. How do you know? And and. 
So one of the things that you want to do is you want to go in after your queen is established and she's laying like like uh, the pattern that you see there on the screen. You got a lot of a lot of sealed brood. That's what you're going to be counting, sealed brood. How many uh, cells are on that cell are on that frame are sealed? And and here's just kind of a rule of thumb, and you begin to learn to guess. And and if you practice it, you get pretty good. But on a deep frame, a deep frame is is 90 cells across and about 50 tall. So that's about 4,500 cells on one side of a deep frame. They're going to vary depending on the manufacturer and how the bees draw the comb. And you're going to have to find out on your equipment, but count the cells across and the count the cells down and you get an idea of how many cells on a side double it you've got how many cells on a frame take a frame and and estimate how many is on there how many does that look like I'm gonna say out of 4,500 there's probably about I don't know 3,800 4,000 cells on that on that frame right there how many on the other side how many on the rest of the frame all right so you, you go into your colony on on a particular day and you count the sealed brood if you really want to count practice, take your take your cell phone camera and take a picture of every frame and take it home and blow it up on your computer screen and count them. You can actually do that. That's easy to do. In 12 days, you go back and you do it again. You count the sealed brood. And then you subtract the difference and you divide by 12 because that's eggs per day. And that gives going to give you the number of eggs per day your queen is laying. And if she isn't in the 1,200 to 2,000 range, in, in fact, if she isn't in the heading towards the 2,000 range, you're going to want to think of maybe about uh, this queen isn't up to snuff. I don't know why. Maybe she's not getting enough food. Maybe she wasn't well mated. Maybe there's a lot of contamination in my colony. Maybe she's just a dud queen. Maybe I don't know why. But let's find out. Let's replace her and get a queen in there that's doing what she should be doing in terms of being an egg laying machine. So good queens. Center of the universe for having a good colony. Next rule. Good genetics. They're not the same. You can have a really healthy queen that's really laying a lot of eggs, which is part of the genetics, certainly. But she may be she may be uh, producing children that just aren't very good bees for whatever reason, not resistant to disease, uh, not good food gatherers, whatever it is uh, that you choose. And you're the one choosing the genetics here. What are the genetics that you want in your colony? Of course, you want it adapted to your location. You want you want a bee that overwinters. I want a bee that overwinters in Ohio that laughs at, boy, they didn't laugh this, laugh this year, but that laughs at Ohio winters. I want Wisconsin queens in Ohio that just really do well in Ohio winters, uh, long, cold, uh, uh, so adapted to my location. Are have got the the flowering sequence figured out on when to get their population going. All of the things that they need to be to be adapted to your location, suitable to your management. And by that I mean, for instance, um, uh, uh, Russian bees tend to be slow in the spring. But you know what? So am I. I'm usually on the road and I'm not getting things going and, and by the time I get home and I have enough time to do bee work, if I've got Italians, they've, uh, they're have they in the trees and gone. I mean, they've swarmed and, and I, I wasn't paying. Not that I wasn't, I didn't want to, it's just that I wasn't there. So my management says I want bees that are slower in the spring to build up and to get ready and to start doing what they're going to do and because I'm slow in the spring. If you're fast in the spring, if you're one of those people who, you know, January where you're out there with a you know trying to get a queen excluder on because you're just eager to, to to get going and if you're in southern Florida that's probably about right so you want bees that get get up early in the spring you want them you want bees that are taken off and 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 Russians aren't going to be yours you can't push a slow bee and you can't slow down a fast bee so get you know when you're looking for the genetics get bees that are suitable to your management of course, one of those is resistant to common problems, and that's part of part of uh, uh, every be, every every queen should have some resistance. The more, the better. Varroa, the nosemas, any any of the any of the problems that um, um, bees are going to run into, and of course, that resistance is is expressed in often hygienic behavior, good grooming, uh, the bees coming out of 
Purdue, they call them the ankle biters because they're what they're doing is they're they're uh, removing varroa and and damaging them so that the varroa don't come back. So some kind of resistance, and the more you can get, the better you're going to be. The less the less uh, the easier your IPM program is going to be to control varroa and all of the other things that are going on in your colonies. Efficient producers. And by that I mean, you know, the old age, the, the the old adage, it takes a lot of bees to make a lot of honey, and that's exactly right. Uh, you got to have a lot of bees, but you got to have them at the right time, and and that's uh, kind of goes back to adapted to your location. Is when do your bees get ready? If your honey flow is really early, and cuts off early in the in the you know early summer, late spring, uh, like it is down south, you're going to need bees that get up early and 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 uh, normally get up early, naturally get up early, rather than you having to push them hard. Our spring up here in Ohio is a little bit slower, so I don't have to push them quite as fast. So by efficient producers, I mean bees that are eager to make, eager to collect honey and, and have all of the attributes, behavior attributes that, that uh, make that possible for them and well behaved. I, uh, there's a, there's a, there's an old line that says mean bees make more honey and, and often that's true. But it doesn't have to be true, and it, but it, often it's true, and the reason for that is because very often you've got bees that are that are less than ideal temperament. Let me put it that way, because they have requeened themselves two, three, four times, maybe two, three, four years, and they have become very well adapted to your location. And one of the things that bees don't select for for themselves is gentle behavior. In fact, they kind of go the other direction and be becoming quite defensive because they're good at producing a lot of honey and because they're adapted to the location and they're good at protecting that honey. They don't want to get robbed. They don't want to get you know predators and, and pests in the way. So they don't select for good behavior, but but they do select for uh, survivor. And being a survivor is a lot of honey. And and you can select for the same behaviors minus the bad attitude. And you can have bees that produce a lot of honey yet aren't aren't nasty. So uh, well behaved, especially if you've got bees in town, or you've got neighbors, or you've got kids or you you're you're all over you know you got bees all over with a lot of people got to have well behaved bees but remember uh, out of Wisconsin um, I used to work at the university there and and one of the one of the cardinal rules that came out of the research at the Wisconsin USDA bee lab was that, that an average queen in, an, in a great colony a colony that's strong that's healthy that's got a lot of bees that's well taken care of it's going to outperform the best queen in the world in a poor colony one that's sickly doesn't have enough food doesn't have enough bees so the, a good queen with good genetics in a good colony is going to do much much better for you than a good queen with good genetics in a colony that's not doing well. And and the not doing well part rests on your shoulders. The beekeeper needs to be making sure that everything's in place for a good queen to do the best that she can do. All right, moving on to number three of the ten rules: pest management. Roa is at the top of the list. Uh, every list, any list. Uh, you got to deal with Varroa, you got to know about Varroa. Uh, how you do it, there's a whole lot of ways you can do, but you got to deal with Varroa. You cannot just hope that it works. One of the ways that you may be dealing with Varroa is, is dealing with resistant bees, survivor bees, whatever you want to call them. That may be dealing with Varroa, and that if that's working for you, that's the way to go. If you don't have resistant bees, or if you're not sure you have resistant bees, or you want to make sure that they're resistant, then you have to be monitoring the population and looking at what's going on with the population of mites compared to the population of the colony, the time of the year, uh, the size of the colony, and, 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 and those sorts of things. So you have to deal with Varroa. Integrated pest management, all of the things that, that you're doing that, that um, uh, indicate that your colony is beginning to suffer because of a Varroa population. How do you control the Varroa population? And that's where the, the integrated uh, pest management comes in. You're doing things like like uh, drone trapping, uh, certainly an easy way to go. But then there's the, the soft chemicals. Uh, 
and these are the essential oils and and there are several of them out there uh, the hard chemicals I'm 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 just reluctant to ever to ever suggest that people use those but boy they work well they work most of the time unless you've got mites that are resistant to them and those are becoming more and more common humifos and fluvalinate have have not quite used up their their usefulness but are getting close and the residues that those chemicals are leaving in, in your beeswax are are uh, bad for the bees bad for the wax bad for you so the essential oils uh, as a as a second level after after integrated pest management in, in integrated pest management program certainly in work but the hard chemical amitraz is a hard chemical but it seems to be better on the wax and your bees than the other two but you in most cases a good IPM program and essential oils are going to going to keep your mite population in check and resistant bees and you monitoring the population so be aware of Varroa. Of course there's the foul broods you have to be aware of uh, you have to be able to identify them and then what do you do um, to me there's only one choice when I when American fowl brood comes and that is destroy the equipment you can use antibiotics but there's anti antibiotic resistant fowl brood out there that is uh, uh, reacting to application of that chemical there are other antibiotics out there but but once you start treating you always have to treat you're on that you're on that bandwagon and then you just never get off so if you've got foul brood learn to identify it uh, get rid of it uh, by destroying your equipment and it's an expensive it's an expensive treatment but it is the best treatment European of course um, always almost always uh, the best treatment for European fowl brood is the honey flow, and 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 you can create a honey flow because a European is a stress, much like chalk brood and and some of the other ones. It's a stress disease, and it's usually in the spring. And enough good food will go a long way in helping your bees cope with those diseases. You've got some of the viruses, most of which are varroa related. Control the varroa, and you're going to deal with the the viruses that go with them. And then there's the wax moss, small hive bee. Uh, mice, skunks, and bears. Tracheal mites really aren't much of a problem anymore, but uh, how do you know unless you look? And and uh, I, I can't say enough about taking a good a good sample of bees and sending them to the Beltsville Bee Lab and getting a report back from them on what really is going on in your hive. They'll give you nosema, they'll tell you about varroa, and they'll tell you about tracheal mites. So if you suspect something's going on, you can't. You look, you can't see. It just doesn't show up. Doesn't make sense. You know, go the go the have your bees tested. It'll go a long ways to to. Uh, um, uh, tell you what's going on. Mice, skunks, and bear. Uh, mice, you know, in the fall, skunks get your colonies up off the ground. Bear build a fence, and and that those are simple, yet expensive, but simple ways to to deal with those pests. But you got to, if you've got those pests, you got to deal with them. Control swarming. Um, uh, and there's a lot of there's a lot of people who are beginning to look at this and say, well, maybe controlling swarming isn't isn't as necessary as we think it is because I'm not in it for the honey anyway. And there's a lot of people out there anymore, or beginning, you know, fairly new people who aren't in it for the honey, and they're letting their bees swarm. And letting bees swarm isn't a terrible thing. However, if you're in the middle of downtown New York City and you stop traffic for four hours because of a swarm, or uh, you have you, you you shut down your neighborhood because of a swarm, then you then the, the swarming becomes less a management issue with your hive and a neighbor uh, a neighbor issue. Um, uh, with the people around you so controlling swarming can be important for a lot of things but when a colony swarms you're you know you're going to lose some of your bees and where are they going to go but the colony that re remains behind usually does fairly well you're not going to have a terrible loss of honey although perhaps some you've got that break in the brood cycle which isn't bad for uh, some things with um, controlling varroa that's one of the IPM management techniques for controlling varroa is dealing with um, um, putting a break in the brood cycle so that uh, female varroa mites don't have anywhere to go but if controlling swarming is important anticipate pollination you know population growth 
One is to grow. It grows on the cusp of your local nectar flows. Localized bees are going to know that there's a lot of food coming in. When the weather's good, and in Ohio we have not had that luxury yet this year, but when the weather's good uh, and, and there's a lot of food coming in and there's a lot of food stored, uh, the colony gets the message that swarming might be in, in the plans here and they begin, they get the trigger and things start happening. So if you're ahead of the curve, you're providing room in advance, you uh, uh, might be doing any of the, uh, the, the management techniques that, that help uh, reduce swarming, making splits, doing all of those things uh, uh, that, that are going to uh, alleviate the, the, the situation in the colony that will, that will cause the trigger to be pulled before it gets pulled. So you can control it once, you, once, once they've decided to go, once you've got queen cells, once those things happen, it gets, it gets messy. So you're going to reduce populations before the honey flows. You're going you're to have two happy colonies or maybe three, or you're going to have a big happy colony because you fooled them uh, into believing that uh, they've already swarmed. There's a hundred ways to control swarming out there, but you have, if you want to stop it, you have to apply one of them and you have to do it at the right time. And, and we could be here for two weeks at talking about swarming and, but know that, that if you're a honey producer, controlling swarming is going to be important. Provide a safe environment. And here's what I mean by that. There's a lot of things that, that are going to cause problems with your bees. Keep your equipment in perfect condition. And that, you know, that just goes without saying. But how many times have you watched your hive stand rot and your hive tip over? And, and that's just real common sense things to keep checking. But after four or five years, it's wet on the ground. You go out there one day or one winter day and it tips over and then you've got a mess. So it, just keep checking your equipment. Be safe inside the hive by keeping only new clean wax. That's a lot easier said than done. Um, rotating out old comb. You know, I used to, they used to say three, and I'm saying right now the, the, the data shows that that two-year-old comb is to the point where it's beginning to cause stress in the colony. And this gets expensive, but at the same time, um, um, uh, you know, what are you going to do? You're, you're making your bees live in a place that's, and this, you know, even if you're using foundation, foundationless comb, uh, top bar hives, or you're just you're just putting empty frames in a colony and letting them draw out their own comb. After two years, the stuff that they're bringing back, agriculture chemicals, is enough to cause a problem. So, don't think that just because you don't use foundation, you're escaping this because you're not. We're inundated with agricultural pesticides and getting them out of your colony is always a good thing. These chemicals are contributing to uh, part of the health problems that our bees are having and they're constantly exposed to them. And would you raise your kids in an environment like that? Think about that. And that's what you're making bees do. So be, out, be safe outside by being as isolated as possible from other bees. I wish I could get farther away, and it's not because I don't like my neighbors and because my neighbors are bad beekeepers, but um, you become your neighbor's beekeeper once you get close enough that, that um, um, uh, my bees can drift to theirs, their bees can drift to mine, and what are they bringing my bees? And you look down at the bottom there, and you look at some of those holding yards and the almond yards of, of uh, almond orchards of California, and, and, and everything that exists bad. Everything bad that exists in the United States of bees is in that field and that field then is split into pieces and brought back home. So the, the, those guys are doing a really good job of sharing the wealth, if you will. And I don't know an answer to it, but if you do, if you can get your bees far enough away that you don't have to worry about being real close to somebody, uh, certainly uh, strive in that direction. Avoid agriculture pesticides for all the reasons that I said. Uh, even low doses, our bees are picking them up and bringing them back to the hive. They're getting, they're contaminating the wax, and of course, direct sprays uh, are are lethal or or accumulatively sublethal and and um, just causing uh, just causing problems. I mean, it's poison and it's in the environment, and your bees are exposed to it. Get them as far away as possible. Keep good records. Uh, 
goes without saying, it'll over over years it will make you a better beekeeper because you will record all of the mistakes that you've made, and maybe after three or four years we'll learn from them, and and I won't make them the fifth time instead of uh, like I did the last four times. But having a good records, and there's a lot of good record keeping systems, very sophisticated smartphones to to uh, a, a notebook in the truck. Uh, they all work. If you use them, and there's the key, if you use them. Have extra equipment. That go, kind of goes without saying if, for hive tools because, um, you know, you almost always you're going to drop a hive tool and, and, and uh, lose it in the grass. And if you don't have another one in the truck or another one hidden under the, uh, under the cover of a hive next door, uh, you're stuck out in the field and, and no way to get hives apart. So, uh, I keep a hive tool in my bee yard all the time just on the, on an inner cover. And, and, uh, I certainly suggest that you do, but it goes beyond that. If you move bees for a living, uh, if you're a pollinator or you're moving to a honey flow or something and suddenly you don't have a truck, do you have plan B in place to get those bees moved? If you've got a contract that says be here midnight Wednesday and you don't have a truck, what are you going to do? And, and thinking ahead is going to say, yeah, I know, but, uh, uh, I got a friend who's got a truck and, and we've talked goes without saying any of the equipment that you have do you have do you have extra equipment um, uh, more more boxes than you probably need not a lot more but more boxes than you need queen excluders everything that you need or where can you get one in a hurry and that's probably more important uh, I know you know Joe's got stuff and I can go over there and get it anytime I need it he can come over and get mine anytime he needs it uh, we've got a plan B in place so that we don't um, uh, jeopardize our bees or our operation because I didn't have one in place. Enough room at the at the right time. This, uh, of course, kind of goes with swarm control, uh, obviously, uh, what we just discussed, but uh, it also has to do with honey production and brood production. And, and if you begin to limit the space that the bees have for honey storage, they're going to do a couple of things. The one thing that they're going to do is they're going to start filling up the brood nest with honey if there's a lot of nectar coming in, which reduces the ability of the queen to lay because there's not enough room. And after a very short period of time, even that's going to be full and you're not going to have room to store nectar for honey and you're going to curtail your honey production. So so it's, a, it, it's not even a fine line. It's a kind of a broad line of having too much space in your colony and not enough space. But during a honey flow, having a little bit too much space isn't a bad idea because if you don't have it, if the bees don't have a place to put nectar when it comes in, uh, uh, they're just going to tell everybody to quit foraging and that's just honey you'll never collect. Uh, honey they'll, they'll never store and have to overwinter on. So uh, it goes the same with pollen and, and, and uh, again for uh, the queen to have uh, room to lay brood in. So have enough room uh, for all of those things. Being able to predict when that's going to happen is a sign of an experienced beekeeper. You know that uh, most years uh, by a certain date I'm going to need to be putting supers on. And it's not and it's not like it was 50 years ago. You go out in the spring and you put all the boxes on and you come back in the fall and you take them all off and harvest the honey. It's, it's following the seasons and adding them as you need them. But adding them as you need them, not, not being late, not having, providing enough room. So enough room at the right time. Enough good food. <clears throat> I'll add to that by saying enough good food all of the time for every bee in the bunch. And this is probably, this, this is of the things that are going, that are stressing our bees right now, this is certainly in the top three. Uh, not enough food. There's not enough forage out there in a lot of places. There's not enough forage all year long. And there's one of the things that we, we, we don't think about is, boy, I got it. right now I've got a lot of things blooming. There's trees blooming and there's, there's uh, you know, wildflowers blooming and things are looking good. But what happens in July? And what's blooming in July? And what's blooming in August? And if I don't make it in April and May, I... Uh, and they store it, am I going to have enough food in July and August? And, and, and it's enough good food all of the time. And, and we, we as a group of people, beekeepers, tend to not look at that as much as we should. We kind of think that, yep, it's honey flow and the rest of the season they have to live on what they made. Well, you have to make sure that there's enough out there. All of the time you have to make enough. And it has to be good food. 
uh, there has to be enough of it and it has to be all season long. The cheapest insurance and the best medicine you can find. What happens when, when you get sick? Uh, uh, one of the first things that happens is we go out free, we quit eating, eh, I don't feel so hungry, and, you know, and your body begins to suffer because it doesn't have in, you know, calories and all of the good things that you need coming in. Well, that's what you need to do with bees, especially with some of the, with the nosema that's going on. One of the problems is bees quit eating. And, and, and that just feeds, if you will, on itself and that pretty soon, pretty soon, Bees begin to expire because they're not eating. It just, it's real simple. So what you need to do as the beekeeper is be aware of the fact that, that there's not enough good food and provide enough good food. And even go so far as to stimulate those bees that are ill and, and get them to eat. And any of the, the, the feeding stimulants that are on the market, as far as I can tell, I've tried a lot of them, they all seem to do what they claim. They, they, they encourage bees to eat. They stimulate bees to eat. And a sick bee that eats isn't going to be as sick or is going to get better and is going to be able to do her job in the colony, whether she's a nurse bee or a forager or a guard or whatever. So so enough good food all of the time for every bee in the bunch. Maybe even grow your own. I really advocate, we don't, our Medina Club has got a good program going for uh, making seed bombs, and we're selling seed bombs to everybody that, that we can get them to, and, and we've got a wildflower mix, and, and uh, you just... Every flower counts. Jeff Pettis says every bit helps, and he's exactly right. So anytime you can put a flower in place somewhere, uh, you're going to help your bees. But of course, when you're feeding them, you need, you know, if you can feed them uh, honey and pollen, that's the best. But, but anything that you're getting into them that they're eating means that they needed it. And if they, if they don't take it, uh, they probably didn't mean it, but it's cheap insurance. So enough good food all of the time for every bee in the bunch. Only healthy hives. And, and this kind of sounds like some of the other things that we've talked about. Uh, but but it, it's also in other directions. Avoid stress. Uh, and, and, and here's an easy way to, to reduce some stress in your hives. Get them in the sun. A uh, hive in the shade is going to have more problems with varroa and more problems with small hive beetle than a hive in full sun. Most of us don't get to choose when we work bees. We end up working bees when we can. And one of the one of the uh, uh, issues with that is I get home from work at 5 and I get out to my bees at 5 o'clock and boy, it's hot out there at 5 o'clock. So a little afternoon shade might be good. Well, Good for you or good for your bees, and and I'm gonna lean towards good for good for you is come should come in second. So one easy way to avoid stress is get them into full sun all of the time. Uh, easy to do and 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 certainly is gonna help. Don't nurse failing colonies. Um, how many times? How I, I wish I had a nickel for every every dink that I've tried to save, I'd be a rich man. You know, you look at this guy, yeah, I'll make it. She'll be okay. I'll get her some food and we'll protect her and, and she'll grow up and be a full size. And they never do, or they almost never do. You spent a lot of time and a lot of energy and a lot of resources uh, on a colony that just isn't going to, the queen was bad, bad location, whatever the reason. It's healthy. There's no disease there. But they just never took off. And you just try and try and make it and it doesn't work. So so rather than spend time and resources on a dink, combine, as long as it's healthy, combine it with maybe you've got two or three others in there. And, 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 and suddenly you've got one good colony. Make sure that you keep the right queen of those three. Uh, a good queen, a good productive queen that has all the attributes that we talked about earlier. Uh, you want to make sure that that happens, but but don't spend a lot of time uh, trying to save a dink because it's just not going to work, or it doesn't work often enough to just, in my opinion, justify the time and resources it takes. Take your losses in the fall. Uh, 
that that's got to be 200 years old but it's it's still good advice is take your life don't try and overwinter a weak colony don't try and over don't try to feed a colony 400 pounds of sugar to get it through the winter why not join it to a colony that has and 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 combine the resources and and instead of going into the the winter with three strong and two weak colonies why not go into winter with three really strong colonies and and no weak colonies. And next spring you'll have colonies to split, and you'll have you'll have colonies alive rather than empty wood. And and you'll be better off. And your bees will be better off, and uh, you'll have saved yourself a lot of grief in the in the in the long run. Be proactive with food, queens, medications, and room. And that's kind of summing up what we were talking about before. But it goes back to avoiding stress. And if you're ahead of the curve on making sure that your bees never begin to wonder about food, never start looking for it, never, it's just always enough food is in the colony all of the time. So there's one stress they don't have to worry about. If the queen is failing, you should be aware of that. You should be looking at how many, how many eggs per day she's laying, is she declining, is is uh, what are what are the things going on that you measure your queens by, and uh, is their colony superseded? And you didn't know it, and you know, and you do, you do know that they superseded because you marked your last queen, right? So so be proactive with with your queens as they're beginning to fail. You're going to replace them before they really fail, or before the colony supersedes her and produces uh, mm. one of their own. And then you've got unknown genetics in your colony. Where did she go? Who did she mate with? So uh, be proactive with queens with medications if you're using them. Uh, uh, I'm certainly not suggesting that you treat a colony that's not sick. But if you are using if you are using medications for any of the problems that bees have, don't wait until the colony is almost dead before you find the problem and then start putting start putting uh, medications in. Be ahead of the curve and nip it in the bud, as it were, and 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 get that done so that it's the least amount of stress on your colony. Go back to avoid stress and room. And it's room for, you know, uh, for, for swarming, for nectar, all of, this, all of the things that we've talked about before. But once you start pushing those buttons, you are adding stress to the colony. And, and the rule is avoid stress and all of the things that you can do. And, you know, I haven't said anything that beekeepers can't do here. And it, it's a, a function of timing and being at the right place, doing the right thing at the right time. And, and you can do that. So you can avoid a lot of stress just by being on time. Winter well. Um, for those of you in southern Florida, you can you can uh, check your email if you want because wintering isn't too much of a problem down there. But for the rest of us, winter is a problem. Uh, it's a stress. It's uh, a challenge, and and even even if it's a short, mild winter, it's still not a good honey flow season. So your bees aren't doing what they really want to do. So as winter approaches, depending on where you are, and that's always the case, and you got to have enough food stored and both carbs and carbohydrates and protein, and and that just goes without saying, but. It needs. It continues to need to be said. I. I am not going to assume that my bees have gathered enough food and not check. But how much is enough food? And and therein lies the the question. The answer to that question is a, it's going to go a long way to help you to winter well. I can give you numbers for here in Ohio, and you can probably adjust them accordingly to where you are. But when I have two eight-frame deeps, and I use eight-frame equipment. And 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 a bottom board, an inner cover, and a telescoping cover, and bees and brood and honey inside. On about the first of October, I want that colony to weigh about 150 pounds. The whole box, bottom board, wood, wax, everything. I want it to weigh about 150 pounds. And I, that's an easy number to find. You can see the on the upper left hand corner there that spring scale, and you get one that goes up to a couple hundred pounds. So that it's going to be enough, and you put it on the front, and you put it on the back, and you add the two numbers, and you're real close to exactly what that colony weighs. It's that simple. 
but if you don't do it, you're guessing. I've heard the old the old story about hefting. If you if a colony is so heavy you can't heft it, um, uh, it's heavy enough. Well, when I was 20, my hefting weight was a lot different now that I'm almost well. I'm not going to say, but uh, I'm not 20 anymore, and my hefting is going to be different now than it was then. So I'm going to go by the scale and and. Uh, that's going to tell me. So if I weigh that and it comes in at 100 pounds or 120 pounds, I know that I've got a problem. I've got to get some food in there. And and here in Ohio, first of October, I got a month to get some food in there. Uh, we can get a lot of a lot of uh, sugar into a colony in a month. And so it's again, it goes back to the right place at the right time, doing the right thing. If I know that my colony is light, I got to know that it's light early enough that I can get food in there. So uh, enough food stored. Carbs and protein. If you're feeding, if you're feeding um, protein and you're using a protein supplement, uh, know two things uh, about uh, uh, how that works. One is if you're using the patties and you're putting them on top of the colony, the bees that are eating the patties are consuming that protein and they are adding that protein to their bodies. And that's going to help them over winter, and it's going to help them next spring. Uh, if you're feeding dry powder, uh, like uh, uh, bulk feeding outside, uh, they're going to store that like they do pollen, and they'll use that in the colony to feed their young. All of that protein is going to be used to feed the young, but know that, that the, the patty protein is added to the bees and and if there's a shortage next spring that's the protein that she will extract from her body to, to feed the young so that they don't go short the powders are going to be stored and and going to use much like pollen of course feeding pollen is the best but that's difficult to do kind of when you're dealing with pollen you've collected in a pollen trap but not impossible so enough good food superior enough bees how many bees do you need I like to have about seven or eight frames of bees, uh, both sides mostly covered, on a, on on 16 frames in my in my uh, uh, in my colonies. So uh, it, again, we'll go back to dealing with dinks. If you've got colonies that are small population, and I know some you know races of bees are going to have fewer bees than others, so you take that into consideration. But um, uh, if I've got two small colonies, and I'm looking at you want enough bees in your colony that they can that they can go around the edges and over the top and bottom of, of at least four or five frames when you're going into winter. Because if they can get to the other side of a frame, they can get to the food. And if they can't get there without without uh, breaking cluster, um, you're not going to have enough bees by the end of winter. Protection. I like to wrap colonies. I've done it most of my uh, life. I learned to keep bees in Wisconsin, and that that's one of the rules in Wisconsin. And then I still keep it up. I don't, I don't insulate the heck out of them, but I wrap them for wind protection. And, and I use black. I use sometimes black uh, roofing material. I there's some black plastic with a little bit of insulation, or those cardboard boxes. They all work about the same. And and it provides wind protection, and it slows down the cooling at night when when uh, they've warmed up on a warm winter day. Uh, an unwrapped colony is going to cool off faster, and sometimes bees that have broken cluster get caught away. So it kind of mediates um, the temperature uh, change extreme. Ventilation. I've uh, got to have it. I have screen bottom boards, and I put a I put a slot in, and I leave about the back third. Uh, open and I've got almost a draft going up the back of that colony, but I don't have I don't have soggy bees ever and extreme ventilation. Take care of the bees that take care of the bees that go into winter. Uh, can't stress that one enough. The bees think of it this way: grandparents. If your grandparents are sick, they're not going to be able to take care of your parents as well as they could. If your parents are sick, they're not going to be able to take care of you as well as they should, and you're the one going into winter. So if your grandparents are sick, you're going to be affected. You're not going to be as healthy as you could, have as enough food, all of these things um, that that are necessary. So those are the bees, and those are and, and where I'm from, that's July. You're dealing with taking care of the bees in July, early August, that are going to take care of the bees, that take care of the bees that go into winter, and that's November for me here in Ohio. You can move it on the, your calendar. But 
it almost comes down to the best way to take care of bees is the worst way to make honey because if you're putting treatments on for varroa because your varroa monitoring uh, system says you've got enough that you better be doing something uh, or, or the virus is going to the virus complex is going to take over if you're making honey in July, then you're going to have to do something different because you're, you've got to get a treatment on so that you're taking care of the bees that take care of the bees that go into winter. If you're trapping drones, this probably isn't going to happen. I trap, I trap drones religiously. My chickens love eating them when, when uh, uh, I pull a frame out. I start, well, I've got my first one in now uh, already, and, and we will have almost no varroa by July, and, but I'm still monitoring because sometimes it gets away from me or it gets away from the colony. So uh, winter well, and those are the ways to do it, I think, um, that'll help your bees get through winter. Food safety, this, this is, this is um, not, a, not a honeybee thing, but prevent harvest co contamination. Uh, use the chemicals. If you're using chemicals, don't use too many. Don't contaminate your honey. Cover your honey supers when you're, taking, when you're bringing them back from the field. Uh, just you know, keep covered. Avoid too much heat when you're on capping. And, and uh, if, you're, if you're filtering, check your moisture, making sure that uh, the honey that you're harvesting is, is the, uh, below the, the critical amount. Out, store in clean containers. Real common sense things that sometimes in the rush of harvesting we forget, but just a friendly reminder that, that these are the things that you need to take care of. Hopefully we'll have some honey this year to, to have to worry about. And then do no harm. Uh, certainly all of the things that we just talked about it, taken to extreme, we can we can um, do too much of, especially the chemicals that that can be used. If you if there's a way that you can you can uh, reduce the use of or eliminate the use of any of the chemicals in your hive, boy, strive for that management. Uh, if you can use none, that's good. If you have to use soft chemicals, that's not as good, but better than the hard chemicals. Uh, the organic acids are effective, but they're hard on bees, and there's temperature extremes that you have to avoid so that you don't have uh, problems with queens and, and bees. Store your equipment so that um, uh, wax moth doesn't become a problem. That picture down on the bottom is an excellent super storage. You're never going to have wax moth problems and something like that, but you can do it in your garage just by cross stacking and using the chemicals that, that people recommend uh, you put on stored supers is just downright unacceptable in my opinion. Uh, wax moth hate light and air and any way you can store them so you get light and air between uh, frames and boxes is going to solve that problem for you. And you know what? A lot of times uh, the, best, the, the best way that I, I stack my boxes crossways in the garage and, and the wax moth gets some of them sometimes in the summer but you know the ones that they get are the ones I should have been replacing anyway. So they're kind of doing me a favor when it comes to that. They're, they're getting rid of the, the old junk and, and make it, making me do something about getting rid of old combs. So um, uh, if, you can, if you can avoid the chemical route, absolutely uh, head in that direction. I think um, we've got maybe a couple more things to think about. And these I call beekeeper rules. It's not bees, but beekeeper rules. And, and, and uh, these are some things that kind of put us out into the community in a way. Continuing education. Have you taken, have you taken a master beekeeper class in your area? Uh, should you take a master beekeeper class in your area? Uh, I sort of strongly recommend it, or at least explore it so that, so that you know um, what it's about and what kinds of things that people are expecting you to know. Uh, uh, do you belong to your local association? Absolutely you should belong to your local association. If nothing else, it, it, it gets you involved in, in the association, but lets you meet the people that you, maybe you don't want your bees next to. Uh, or maybe you do want your bees next to. So you should be in membership. And if you're in an association, you know everybody, every group is always looking for somebody to help out, to be a leader, to, to, ta to take over when, when you know, somebody needs, when you need an officer. If you haven't been an officer in your association, it's a whole new experience. It'll be a lot of fun. 
uh, and the work isn't going to kill you and you'll learn something and you'll get to meet more of the people in your group than you thought were even there. So if you haven't done it yet, consider being an officer. What about teaching a beginner's class or maybe one of the beginner's classes? Lots of groups have several several teachers and and each one teaches something that they are you know specialized in there's somebody who can teach about overwintering somebody can teach about feeding those sorts of things so if you've got some good experience maybe raise your hand and say yeah I can teach that this year uh, and work it out with with the and and then be a mentor I uh, can't say enough about being a mentor it's hard to do. It takes time. Uh, it kind of puts you on the spot because your new bee, bee, the new beekeeper is going to always ask questions, always ask questions. You can set some rules, you know, don't call me after 10 o'clock at night, those sorts of things. But but uh, being a mentor, it's going to, you know, there's nothing that teaches you more about doing something than having to teach it. And, and that way you've got to learn it so you've got the answers. So if you haven't, be a mentor. Um, uh, consider it. Beekeeper health. Do you know how to get, use an EpiPen if you had to use one? And if you don't, I think it's time to learn because one of these days somebody, you're going to be with somebody and they're going to tip over and A, do you have one handy and B, do you know how to use it? And, and the answers to both of these should be yes because if you don't, you know, you may lose a friend laying it underground because you don't know what to do. So Consider that, especially if you've got a bee, uh, uh, your bee yard, your club has a bee yard. Um, uh, three or four people should have those and know how to use them. How to lift heavy boxes? Every beekeeper's got a bad back, or will have, is the saying, and unless you know how to lift a box, the ergonomics of, of using your legs and bending and all of those things, if you don't know how to do that, have somebody show you, because if you know you pick up a 100-pound deep super full of honey, and you hear that crack, and then you just know, life just changed, because uh, I didn't do something right. How to avoid and stop robbing on your colonies? How do you avoid it? How do you stop? How do you stop robbing in your colonies? If you get something, if you've done something silly one day and and you've got a colony open all day do you you know there's all sorts of ways to do it um, my advice is to k shut everybody up tighter in a drum I don't care if it's the middle of the day because a robbing incident can be a fatal incident if you're in a, in a town if you're on the country it's not quite so bad but you're still going to have animals and, and nearby people that could be harassed so how to avoid and how to stop robbing do you know the symptoms of heat exhaustion or heat stroke if you're out in a bee yard and suddenly you start feeling cold and clammy and dizzy what's going on and what do you do about it and how much time do you have and what if you're out in a bee yard 10 miles from home and that's one of the que the next question do your spouse know where all your bee yards are if you're tipped over in a field with a heat stroke, and the cell phone ain't going to do you any good because you're not going to hear it when she calls you. So if 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 nothing else, it'll give it'll give the authorities some place to go look for the body. Um, so so have a map where your bee yards are and exactly if you got to go down the hills, you know, and around the fence, have that on the map so that people know how to get there. Could you control a life-threatening situation in five minutes? It's a colony out of control. People are getting stung. Uh, it's 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 a nightmare. It happens rarely, but it happens. But when it happens, are you ready for it? Here is a way to do it. This is how they do it in Florida when they're dealing with a hot African ice colony. A very large black plastic uh, garbage bag put down over the top of the colony. Get it all the way to the bottom. Tip the colony on its back and tie the bag shut. That's the end of that colony. It'll kill the bees. They'll overheat in a heartbeat, but you have stopped a situation. So if you if you if if you don't have a bag along with that hive tool in your bee yard and underneath the uh, the cover on an inner cover on one of your yard, maybe now is the time to think about getting one there. So um, all of these things, these are beekeeper rules, not not beekeeping rules, but consider them as, and I consider them uh, just as important as, as being able to do well keeping bees. And I think that's all that I have, 10 plus rules for modern beekeeping. Great, thanks, Kim. We have a few questions, uh -huh. and uh, Frank yes. is, I think, thinking uh, about with great difficulty. to know the best way to change. Uh, it's probably the best way to answer that, numbers. and and I don't have, I don't, I, you know, you, there's there's the there's the the, the 
what I call the pruning method, and that's just changing the shape of your frames. You can cut a deep frame that's not being used. You know, I mean, not with bees and wax, or not with bees and honey in it. But as you cycle out of uh, frames, out of, um, um, uh, I use a big pruner. Or I used a big pruner. I finally got rid of my last deep recently. But I just use a big pruner, and you don't have a bottom bar on a frame, but it does work. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, not the best way, but it is a way. But gradually, as, as you know, as you get, as, as you get rid of, uh, um, as you start cycling out your deep frames and you have to replace the wax in them because you're doing that anyway, when you got down to 10, then you get rid of the deep box and you bring in a medium box. Well, I I, I, I kind of use the term generically, Jim and I'm, I'm about talking about the essential oils. And there's several of them out there. Uh, the mode of action is 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 as I understand uh, how how essential oils work is that is that the chemical reaction from essential oils reacts with the chitin of insects, and it essentially dissolves. Or, or softens the uh, the chitin on an, on an insect or a mite, and and it gets down to everything else. You're trying to kill a bug on a bug, and the dose from the dose from uh, the essential oils that we put in our colonies is enough to to really weaken mites, but not so much bees. But it does bees a little bit, which is why it's a soft chemical. But um, uh, a short duration and and uh, you know a moderate exposure. Isn't is isn't hard on bees. It's not easy, but it's not hard, and it's hard on mites. So, soft chemicals. Yeah. Well, well. In Carolina, it doesn't protect the bees. Dip of boxes it's going to protect, protect the box the from diseases. Uh, and instead of painting. Um, but I, I don't think it's going to do much for diseases and pests of the bees inside the box. But it's a good way. To, it's a good way. You, those boxes will be along, around longer than we are. Uh, it does a good job of, of doing that. Okay, and let's end with Natalie's Absolutely. question about vegetable well, some gardens of them around do. the house. Most and of, she know, wants to know some, if they provide pollen. Uh, uh, the the bees vine crops, the of course, bees are going to visit. And, and uh, if you if you if you got cucumbers or squash or watermelon or cantaloupe, uh, and you want to spend a, uh, an interesting hour some morning, uh, especially with cucumbers, go watch a cucumber flower and see how many bees visit a cucumber flower from about six in the morning until noon. And and afternoon the flowers pretty much shut off. Their pollen is gone and their nectar is gone, and and they're they're pretty much fertilized by then. But you'll see, uh, cucumber flower takes you know it's up to a hundred visits to get all of the seeds in a cucumber pollinated. So yes, they're going to provide some. However, it's volume, and what you need is acres of cucumbers to really help your bees in terms of the amount of food that they're going to collect. But they'll collect some, and and like I said, every flower counts. Great. Thanks, Kim. Thanks so much for your time and expertise. I really appreciate your leading this webinar. And folks, if you could put a thank you in the chat pod for Kim, I know he'd appreciate it. I have put up a couple poll questions.